we want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, we know um, you have a lot of questions and we want to thank everyone that submitted those questions in advance. Um, that's helped us kind of plan tonight. What we're going to do is some introductions and latest developments. Um, and then we're going to go through these questions that we've been receiving. Um, so thank you for taking the time to help us prepare. Uh, your questions are making our plans even better for what back to school looks like. Tonight, as we're going through the presentation, uh, please feel free to type additional questions or follow-up questions or comments or concerns there in the chat box. We'll record all of those and take those back to the table as we continue planning. So I just wanna thank all of you for uh, the input you're providing. Uh, your voice is very important to us as we plan for a safe return to school. Dr. McFarland. So yeah, so thank you, Mr. Kirsten, and really thank you to all you teachers who have uh, uh, given up your time to be here today. I know you have a lot of questions. Uh, we have a few answers, but, but more importantly, our main objective today is really to share our initial thoughts. We want you to know that we have been thinking and have been planning for quite some time, but you know, we felt like it was important for us to share these initial thoughts with you, get your feedback, make some modifications to what we were thinking, and then come back to you with actual uh, hardcore plans moving forward. Now, if you're expecting a lot of answers tonight, we don't want to disappoint you, but we do want you to know that our goal tonight, again, is to make sure that we have addressed some of your questions you've already submitted, but more importantly, get more questions so that we can make sure that by the middle of August, the first of August, that we have a clear and tangible plan that we all can feel, feel comfortable with, that we can be comfortable in, that we'll be able to share, a, excuse me, be able to create a high quality educational experience in a safe environment for everyone. And so that is our goal. Again, we definitely are excited about you being here tonight. We know that you all submitted a lot of questions and we hopefully will have some answers. But before we do that, I, we do, our, we, we do our, have several of our board members here on the line tonight. We have our board president who will bring you greetings. But we may have other board members on the line tonight. And uh, if so, uh, we definitely appreciate uh, uh, the, uh, the board members as a collective. The reality is our board members are our are, are servants. Uh, they have been very clear throughout this process to me in that they want the number one uh, uh, decision point to be what is safest for all involved. And they have been really, really uh, straightforward with that. And we've been excited to serve and glad to serve with this board. We will now have a, a board president, uh, Mia Hall, bring you greetings from the board. Ms. Hall. Sir, thank you, Dr. McFarland. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mia Hall. I have the pleasure of being um, the school board president, and I bring greetings on behalf of the entire CISD Board of Trustees. We are so delighted that you decided to join us this evening to share your thoughts and your concerns with us as we endeavor on what has to be one of the greatest challenges um, we will ever face um, as a team. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say that I share in your concerns. The board shares in your concerns. Many of us are educators. All of us are parents. And I personally have a CHS senior that reminds me each and every day what's at stake for him as a student. So this does not mean that the board has all of the answers, of course, but we can all rest assured um, that Crowley ISD has the most committed um, innovative, thoughtful, and caring group of education professionals in the business, and fortunately for us, they're at our helm. Uh, leadership and staff at every level have been working day and night to ensure your safety, as well as the safe return of our students. As a former principal, um, former secondary teacher, former secondary assistant principal, I can attest to the difficulty of trying to cover every single aspect of every single detail. And that usually felt like an impossible task as we got ready for school. But I can attest that our CISD team is doing their absolute very best to ensure that all is covered and that we're ready to welcome you and our students back for the new school year. With that said, um, please know that the Board of Trustees is very committed to the CISD team family, which includes every one of our employees, every educator, every student, um, and every family. And your well being, along with the success of our students, are the basis of every single decision that we make as a board. We encourage you to be open, honest, very candid this evening, 
And we sincerely thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of the hard work that you put in um, this spring that helped us see us through and all that we know that you will do for our students this fall and beyond. So just wanna say thank you and we look forward to hearing your, your comments and your concerns as well as your questions this evening. Dr. All right, thank you, Ms. Hall, and definitely thank you for your leadership and service. Thank you. So we also have uh, Ms. Davis on the line. Uh, she uh, is, does not want to say anything, but definitely she's on the line. I wanted you to know that she's here, and I believe a couple other board members will be calling in soon. But again, we are thankful to have a, uh, a school board that, that understands that safety is critical and that really prioritizes safety. So We'll move forward. Uh, as you know, uh, we have several uh, latest, later, latest developments, and Mr. Kirshner will bring forward the latest developments as it relates to COVID-19. Mr. Kirshner. Thanks, Dr. McFarlane, and thank you, President Hall, and all of our board for your support this evening. Um, so tonight's so agenda, how it's going to look. We'll start with the latest developments, what we know now, and then four categories of kind of questions we've received and opportunities to provide additional questions for you in the chat box. Those are on returning to work, what that looks like, what online learning is going to look like, uh, health and safety when buildings reopen, and we'll get a chance to look at a possible day in the life of a CISD student, and what it's going to look like when exposure and absences need to happen. And please continue to type your questions there in the chat box. And so for the latest development, as you all know, um, there's been a lot that's happened within the past week. Um, starting off this week, um, our school board met on Tuesday to officially vote on the delayed start to the school for Crowley ISD. And that's in line with the Tarrant County Public Health Order that was issued. Um, our first day of school will now be Tuesday, September 8th, but that will be 100% online. And then our plan right now is that school buildings would reopen on Monday, October 5th. We would still continue on offering online, op online learning though as an option for families who aren't yet ready to send their children back to school. And you'll see there on the right of your screen that new school calendar, the adjustments that had to be made because of the delay start. And you'll also notice there um, the day that teachers contract would begin would be Monday, August 24th. And on our website also you'll find the new work calendars that align with the school calendar. So I talked about the busy week on the next screen you'll kind of see the agencies that we're following closely. Uh, this within the past seven days we've heard from Tarrant County Public Health. TEA and UIL with some big announcements about the fall. Um, and we're also being told to expect new guidance from the CDC on um, guidelines and suggestions for schools to open safely. And so each time this new guidance come in, comes in, we, we go back and update our plans. Um, and so we're, we're taking this day by day, but what really helps us is hearing from our teachers, the ones who are on the front lines, they know what's happening in the classrooms. Um, in our campuses. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to get your input. So we'll start with our first category of questions that we've been receiving and the hot topic um, right now is what comes first is when are teachers coming back to the buildings? What is the return to work going to look like? Will they be in their buildings? Or will they be at home? Um, so Dr. McFarland, uh, you want to kick us off there? Sure, sure, no doubt. And again, these are our initial thoughts. But what we, what we know is that August 24th is actually the first day that the teachers, all, all returning teachers will report back. And so we are anticipating that all teachers on the 24th will report to their campus. However, that, that decision will be made closer to August 24th. Uh, basically around August 15th or so, we'll, we'll come out with an announcement. They'll let you know whether you'll all be returning uh, to, to, to a face-to-face, -face, in a face-to-face -face format on campus on the 24th, or whether it will have you coming in in phases or in waves, depending on, on what, what department or what campus. We're unsure exactly how that will look, but we do know by August 15th, we will, we will give you, uh, we will have some definitive information. We are just monitoring the, the COVID-19 cases, and what we want to do is take the, take the path that causes the least amount of possibility for exposure. However, we know we do have to get ready uh, for the start of the school. So again, August 24th, that will be your first day. Whether it'll be virtual or some kind of combination of that, you'll find that out around August the 15th. Again, we know that that's, uh, that's definitely something that's, that's uh, important to you all, that's important to us as well. But again, we want to make sure that we have the latest information to make that decision. Now, so as it relates to the second question, and, and really the, whether teachers will be 100% online or not, well, the reality is that we know that uh, uh, we've had some conversations about 
September 8th and what 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 does September 8th look like when we are all virtual, we're 100 percent virtual. Uh, the question has been really whether well the teacher will be able to teach from their home or from their build from their building. Our our perspective, my perspective, uh, my intent would be to ensure that we are all able to teach from the classroom. Now we recognize that there may be some accommodations that we need to make, but our our uh, our initial thoughts right now are that all teachers will actually have to report to campus and deliver instruction from their classrooms for a variety of reasons, but we think that that's, that's going to be the most efficient and effective way for us to do that. Now, what I do know and what we've heard through the surveys and just through conversations is that teachers may have challenges with, with child care, with their own children, and so we are looking at our child development center. We're also looking at creating avenues and opportunities on campuses where teachers are for, to, uh, to be able to provide space for their children to be there on that campus in a learning center format. Uh, but again, we are working through those details, and we'll have those details for you around August the 15th, if not before. But again, our initial uh, in intent is for everyone to deliver online learning from a district facility, uh, preferably their, their classroom. Thanks, Dr. McFarland. And so related to that, if the COVID-19 numbers continue to increase in our community, um, would the district consider extending the, our 100% online instruction past that October 5th date? And what data would we be looking at in making those decisions? You know, again, these are two questions that I can tell you that your trustees, these are two questions that were front and center in our conversation and our decision making. Uh, we decided, of course, to delay uh, the, the face to face to October 5th. Uh, that's because uh, the commissioner gave us a four week window uh, from September. And so what we said was if we moved our start our first day back to September 8th, we could delay for four weeks. That that makes it the October 5th date. However, the commissioner again made a ruling that said that if we need to extend even further, we would have the ability to do that. So the board would have to take action. We'd make a recommendation to the board. We take action to extend. Right now, the furthest we can extend uh, is November the uh, 2nd, I believe. Again, that is something that if numbers increase, we have that flexibility to be able to do, be able to extend face to face until November, no, until the November date. Uh, and again, the, the data that we'll use really will rely on the data from the uh, CDC and also advice from Tarrant County of the Tarrant County Health Department, those two, uh, those two entities will help us to make decisions about number one, when can we bring students back to school? And then number two, uh, you know, what's occurring with the virus and what other precautions do we need to take uh, if there is an increase? Now, if numbers start to go in a different way, again, we can evaluate that and see uh, what we need to do and if we need to make any kind of modifications. Again, these are our initial thoughts, but we do have the flexibility to go past October 5th if the numbers dictate it. Right. And Dr. McFarland, we'd like to remind everyone that Tarrant County Public Health, that was the agency that shut down schools back in spring, countywide made that decision. And then also just this past week, uh, Tarrant County Public Health. And so they're watching the numbers very closely. Um, so our next question, not only from teachers, but as you can imagine, a lot of parents and students is what does online learning look like and how will it be different than online learning was back in the spring? Dr. McFarland and Mr. Keith are gonna answer some of those questions. All right, so be before we go to online learning, just one thing I left out, uh, Kirshner. Uh, so if we decide to return back to building and have, have teachers return to the building, of course, there will be a, uh, a, a screening process that of course adults will have to go through. Anytime we have adults entering the, or anyone entering the building, there's a, screen a screening process that of course you will go through, which involves answering questions rel relative to COVID-19 symptoms and also uh, taking uh, a temperature and requiring a face mask. So if we do return or when we return to work, those will be just a part of the normal procedures or the new normal procedures for entering our building and returning safely to work. Of course, while people are in the building, uh, practicing social distancing will definitely be something that we would be adhering to, adhering to as well. So those are, those are the, the, the key questions, I believe, with returning to work. But again, online learning, as Kirsten uh, shared, is definitely a, a key part, key question. We know a lot of you have questions about that. And so Mr. Keith will be prepared to address uh, the, most of the questions relative to online learning. Uh, Mr. Keith. All right. Thank you, Dr. McFarland, and good evening, everyone. 
Um, first, I just want to start by saying thank you for the work that you did in spring of 2020. So I, I really think what we saw was nothing less than a Herculean effort by all of our teachers and staff to pivot uh, unexpectedly and continue to provide the best instruction that we possibly could for our students. So I do just want to say thank you for that and express again my, my gratitude and admiration for our teachers here um, in Crowley ISD. And so starting with spring now and, and looking forward to what virtual learning looks like in the fall, it's important to realize that it will look very different. We can think of spring as emergency learning or uh, quarantine teaching. And then we shifted into um, our summer school time where we had about 2,000 students enrolled in online summer school. We made some adjustments there. We set up opportunities for students to work in small groups with their teachers. We set up synchronous learning times where they were face to face through Zoom. And we got very positive feedback from students and parents on that. So taking some of the lessons learned from the spring and then from our summer learning, we're going to take those into the fall and really take a look at what virtual learning looks like there. So the first, uh, the first thing to know is that all of our students will have devices when they return to school on September 8th. And that's very important because when we think about virtual learning, we know that each student, not just each household, needs their own access. And so because each student will have their own device, the, the question that we have to think about first is, will this be synchronous or will this be asynchronous? And the answer is, it will be a bit of both. And so we will definitely leverage more synchronous teaching where teachers interact in, in small groups or class groups with students, uh, but we'll also uh, be training teachers in how to post asynchronous assignments that students can complete at their own pace and on their own time. And so that takes us into the question of the Virtual Learning Academy. So, so what is that? We know that we all come back face to, or we all come back virtually on September 8th, but when we make a split on October 5th, students will have the opportunity to continue to choose a fully virtual setting or to return to the school building in person. Those students who choose uh, to take the virtual option will become a part of the Crowley ISD Virtual Learning Academy. And so according to the state, a student can choose to move back and forth between virtual learning and face-to-face -face instruction every marking period. And so those two offerings will run side by side uh, throughout the entire year. And then of course, uh, anytime that we change instructional models, we have, to talk, uh, we have to talk curriculum. So we're taking our curriculum documents, we're providing support for virtual learning, uh, we're purchasing platforms that teachers will use and be trained in on uh, how to present virtual instruction. And of course, we're adjusting our pacing guides and our curriculum documents to make sure that the power standards that were selected this summer, that essential content, are addressed in that synchronous and face-to-face -face instruction. Mr. Keith, we had a question in there um, from Kara Dale. Will the virtual option offer all classes? So that's something that we're working on right now. We've taken our middle school, high school, and CTE course catalogs, and in committees, we're going through course by course and identifying what can be taught virtually, what could be taught hybrid, which would be partially virtual with students coming up to the campus periodically, and then what courses need to be fully in person just due to the demands of the course. And so we hope to have more information um, on that here in the coming weeks. Great. Um, if you go to our next slide, uh, Mr. Handy and Shay Buchanan actually just asked the next question that's going to be on the slide. How will online teachers be selected? Dr. McFarland and Dr. Kohler can talk about that. All right. So basically what we're doing as it relates to uh, uh, staffing, again, there is, there is a process and I'll allow Dr. Kohler to talk about the process, but I just want to give you kind of an overview of how we will have to do the staffing. So. Uh, at the end of, well, not the end, but the uh, after, right after July 4th, we sent out a survey uh, to parents uh, asking who would like online, uh, who would prefer face-to-face. -face. The window for that survey will, was to, to close around July 31st, and we will still stick with that, that timeline. That will give us an indication of how many students that we'll have uh, who choose to, uh, to experience the uh, online format. But what we know now is that TA has said that we have to allow students and parents 
up to two days, excuse me, up to two weeks before the first uh, day, of, uh, day of school to make that decision. So we know that we'll have to open up the uh, window again. The reason why that's important is once we can determine how many students at what grade level, then we'll know how many teachers we need. Again, that, that's gonna be a moving target. Uh, again, because every, at the end of every six weeks, the last two weeks of every six weeks, parents can make a choice to either remain in virtual or switch to face-to-face -to -face or remain in face-to-face -face or switch back to virtual. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving, a lot of new moving pieces. It's almost like fixing a Rubik's Cube. When you get one fixed, the other you have to work with. So this will be a moving target for us. But after, Ju after July 31st, we'll have the first indication. Now the challenge is that all the information that's given to us between July and July 31st can all change between, be, be, between uh, now and, and the time that we have to, have to go face to face. So we know it'll be a moving target, but we will have some indication around August 24th of what classes you'll be teaching and who will be teaching where. Again, it will change. And uh, we know that we'll just be prepared for that as well. But the process for actually selecting teachers, I'll let Dr. Kohler uh, speak, to that, uh, speak to that process. Dr. Kohler. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. Good evening, teachers. It's great to see all of you here. Um, the first question was, how will online teachers be selected? And I want to remind everybody, you know, it's important to remember that all of our teachers are going to be online teachers through at least October 5th. But we, have, um, we are working with the CNI department to develop the process for teachers who are interested in an assignment to the Virtual Learning Academy. Um, that will involve some sort of an application, um, a performance-based task or criteria. Obviously, these folks need to be comfortable with technology and using it to deliver high-quality instruction. Uh, and, and any teacher, including those with health risks, can apply and be considered for an assignment in the Virtual Learning Academy. Um, and again, we're working to develop that process. It's also possible a teacher could be assigned to the Virtual Learning Academy because of a serious underlying medical condition that places them at risk for COVID. Uh, the other question had to do with um, whether or not people would have jobs when this is over and we can return to buildings. I, I don't know when, if ever it will be over, but I think it's important to remember that even when students and teachers can report to the school building, we will have families that choose to remain in the Virtual Learning Academy. So our staff will have jobs but the ability to be flexible will be critical because duties may look different over the course of the year, as Dr. McFarland mentioned, we'll constantly be looking at how many students are enrolled virtually and how many are enrolled when we go face to face. Uh, and it's most important for us to we, that we ensure all of the roles and responsibilities associated with operating school in either the face to face or the virtual environment are covered. Thank you, Dr. Kohler. Our next question is about training for online teachers and what that will look like. I know we have Ms. Stephanie Allen from our professional development department here to talk about that. Ms. Allen? Uh, hello, everybody. Good to see everybody this evening. Um, yes, there will absolutely be training for teachers to be able to deliver the online instruction. We're working closely with the CNI department to make sure that the expectations put out by our CNI department, we're able to train our teachers on. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at, instructional tools, instructional platforms, uh, social social and emotional tools that we can be using online, communication tools. We're also looking at other specifics like uh, grading guidelines with online learning and attendance taking with online learning. So we're looking at uh, the whole picture so that when teachers begin school, they'll be ready to go and have a good grasp on exactly what they need to do to make it happen for our students. All right, thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, so she, she touched on that about attendance training, about how attendance will be taken during our online window. Um, a next question we had on there, Dr. McFarland, is how will paraprofessionals be used to assist with online learning? So, you know, that's, that's a great question. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the biggest challenges with this whole, uh, this, whole, this whole situation is how will we use our personnel? 
The reality is we are currently staffed for 16,000 students across the district. Well, what we already know, just based on the indication that we have from surveys early, about 6,000 or so students, maybe 7,000 or so students uh, have chosen the virtual format. So what we know then is that although we're staffed for 16,000 in a face-to-face -face format, we may only have 10,000 in a face-to-face -face format, or we could have 14,000. And so the challenge is not really knowing exactly how many uh, people will have in face-to-face -face, uh, 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 format. That, that it's hard for us right now to determine exactly what uh, our personnel that we have hired will be assigned to do. What we do know is this, the uh, clause in our contract that says other duties as assigned, that is something that will likely be enacted this year. We anticipate maintaining employment for all the staff that we currently have on, on, uh, that we currently have under contract. Uh, we, we anticipate maintaining that employment. However, what we recognize is that this, this situation is unique and it will require all of us to be flexible and to be able to, to be able to be agile to do what needs to be done during this process. So I've told, told everyone from central office on down to, to paraprofessionals that we have to be prepared to flex. And so that means paraprofessionals who have previous, previously been in the classroom may be helping with other protocols uh, and people that are working in the office may be helping in other places. And so it's just important for us to realize that there may be some changes, maybe some flexes in, our, in, in what we're asking people to do. But I know the question, there was a question about your job. You will still have a job, but the reality is what you're asked to do may be different based on the need. Again, we, we are, we'll, we'll be working through that and we'll know more as we go, but that, those are our initial thoughts as it relates to, to personnel and the paraprofessional. Great, we've had a lot of questions also about how substitutes will work in all this. Um, during the online time, um, if an online teacher needs a sub to take a day off or they're sick, how would that work? And then once we return to the classroom, you know, we, in the past there have been sub shortages and maybe classes were combined, would we still be able to do that? And so Dr. Kohler, can you talk about the plan for substitutes in Crowley ISD? Yes, of course, thank you, Mr. Kirchner. So we're currently working with the professional development department to ensure that the folks who are in our substitute pool are being provided the same trainings our teachers are receiving so they can step in and provide virtual instruction if, if needed. Uh, and as Dr. McFarland said, it's important to remember that we're going to be staffed to serve right at 16,000 students in our buildings. Um, so with six to 7,000 students possibly choosing that virtual instructional model, we will have staff available in our schools to help when needed. So I'll kind of reiterate what Dr. McFarland said that flexibility um, to flex and adjust is going to be critical because individual duties and responsibilities may change during the course of the year. All right. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Dr. Kohler. Um, next question has to deal with um, benchmark and getting ready for STAR and, and of course assessments during online learning and transition back into the classroom. How will that be conducted? Well, you know, th this, is, this is one of those items, and I'm not sure if I mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, town hall that we will have a follow-up town hall closer to the, to the opening or closer to the first day of virtual instruction and really address all of the questions. This is one, the one relative to benchmarks and STAR and assessments. We believe those were important, but we believe right now it's more important for us to focus on the logistics of how do we keep people safe and how do we actually offer online and face-to-face. -face. And again, we will, we will address the benchmark and STAR ELCs uh, at a later date. I can tell you that's not the most important thing to us right now. However, what we know is that it's gonna be so critical for us to understand where kids are uh, when we get them at the very beginning of the year. And so we'll have beginning of the year assessments. We'll have middle of the year uh, uh, indicators and then also end of the year. Star and ELC assessments, we're looking at how we would do those. But right now we know we'll have the uh, beginning of the year, middle of the year and end of the year because we have to make sure that even amidst all these cha challenging, uh, uh, all these challenging uh, variables, that we have to make sure kids are progressing, students are progressing. And so we are, we'll be prepared to do that. It's just, this will be something that we'll spend a little bit more time with uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. We've had a lot of questions about how we'll meet the teacher and these open houses that we traditionally have at the start of the school year. How will those be handled when we're starting online? 
All right, and I believe that uh, Dr. Barry, I know is on the line. I know she's worked uh, quite a bit with principals and we're in the process of really working out what that will look like. Uh, Dr. Barry, why don't you address that item as it relates to Meet the Teacher and how we will uh, be addressing uh, Meet the Teacher. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. McFarland, and good evening all. Um, as in everything, um, campuses are still evaluating a, a process for that, um, likely that being virtual and small groups uh, with teens or, or parents, and we'll talk a little bit later on about um, what, you know, master scheduling, uh, but looking at how we could do that in the team virtual uh, environment for now. And so it may look different for campus, but we have many teams sitting and planning for uh, what that could look like for them. All right. So, Kirsten, I think there were quite a few questions that came in through the chat uh, as we were going through each section. I don't know if you want to stop now and just kind of go back and hit some of those questions before we move forward. Yes, sir. Uh, this question came from Miss uh, Carrie Jo Davis as a teacher and a parent. How long would students be required to be online daily? All right. So I think uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Keith uh, may have some information relative to that based on our online framework. Uh, Mr. Keith. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. So one thing we do know is that students will follow a regular daily schedule. And so as we look at a blend of synchronous and asynchronous instruction, uh, we're trying to limit that time or at least balance that time that students spend um, online and synchronous instruction as well as offline in, in asynchronous. So we're working on those sample schedules right now. Uh, the state earlier this week released, re released some exemplar plans for remote learning that we're looking at and taking into consideration as well. So more details to come on that. And then a question about um, how does virtual learning work? Is it different than Google Classroom? Will Google Classroom be utilized? Could you talk about that, Mr. Keith? So we are looking at um, possibly continuing with Google Classroom. Uh, we are also evaluating a learning management system. The learning management system would give us more control over tracking student engagement and student attendance. And it also provides some more robust tools for creating asynchronous lessons for students. So um, the remote learning would possibly have Google Classroom as a component, but there will be much more attention uh, given to training teachers on how to design work for that remote type of environment. All right, thanks, Mr. Keith. All right, so uh, to keep on schedule, we're gonna go into the next category and just health and safety in buildings, what that looks like when teachers are back in and when students are back in. And to start that off, Dr. McFarley, could you kind of give us an idea of what a day in the life of a Crowley ISD student could look like when they get to return back to the school building. All right, so we definitely would do this, and I just want to just 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 qualify this this day in the life with an understanding that we are thinking through kind of what this could be and what this could look like. And so uh, what we're going to do is start off. We have a we have a student uh, named uh, Jackson, and since uh, Dr. Barry's uh, son is named Jackson, who's starting high school. We're going to allow Dr. Barry to walk us through the day in the life. And then what I'll do, Dr. Barry, is I'll stop you at different points in time, and we'll talk about the protocol connected to the action that you're, des you're describing. So, all right, Dr. Barry, the, the alarm rings, and Jackson gets up. He's ready to go to school. What happens? All right. Thank you so much again. As I'm pushing Jackson out the door. Um, so, uh, hopefully, as a, a parent, I'm going to be taking Jackson's temperature prior to him um, leaving the house uh, to determine that. Uh, as Jackson uh, walks out the door, he is going to uh, walk to the bus stop where he will socially distance himself as, as best as they, they can in that area. Um, when the bus arrives, Jackson is going to get on the bus and, and notice that on the seats there are X's or signs that say, do not sit here where we can um, distance the students on the on the on uh, each individual bus. Jackson's going to find a seat that uh, does not have an X and um, sit on his air-conditioned bus where the windows will also be um, uh, down if we can to, uh, again, continue the, the flow of air on the buses uh, for their bus ride there. All right. So, so one thing also, uh, Dr. Barry, as, as Dr. Barry mentioned, the first thing we're going to be we're going to be encouraging and sending videos out, and really encouraging parents to make sure that, that that parents realize it is their responsibility to take students' temperature before they leave the home. 
Another thing is we know that we have a mask order in across the, across the state and for sure in our district. You know, one of the things is they, the, 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 the law says or the order speaks to students uh, 10 years or older. Well, the reality is if we put it in our student code of conduct that we want all of our students with masks on, then we can allow, we can require all kids to have masks on. So one of the things is as Jackson walks out the house, we're going to make sure he has his mask on and then everyone, every one of the kids around has a mask on as well. In addition, we had to make a decision as it relates to the bus and whether we wanted the bus driver to be uh, managing uh, the mask and temperature and everything, or we just wanted him focused on driving. And so we made a decision that the bus driver, we want the bus driver focused on driving, uh, the bus driver will have his mask on, and before Jackson can get on the bus, the bus driver will make sure that Jackson has a mask on. Now, if Jackson does not have a mask on, what we're going to do is we'll have a stash of masks on the bus so that the bus driver can then just hand Jackson a mask and he moves on. Again, all students on the bus will have a mask. Also, uh, we have talked with Mr. Reeves and with our transportation, and what we know is that the bus uh, must the, the bus will be no more uh, no more than a, a sixty percent capacity. And so what that means is we'll basically have students spaced out on the bus, as, do, as Dr. Uh, Barry described, and Jackson will, will be sitting in, in a place that's there where there is no X. And so we think that will help us at least to social distance. All right. And so Dr. Barry Jackson is on the bus, and now he drives up to North Crowley. Okay. And so once he gets to North Crowley, talk to us about what happens to Jackson, the procedures for Jackson to, to get to where he needs to be. Sure. So as uh, he enters, we will have um, one main entrance um, from the front or the back of the building, depending on what is determined by the campus response team. Uh, as he approaches the door, he'll notice that there are some staff members that have been located uh, at that site, just to ensure, again, as you just stated, Dr. McFarland, that Jackson makes it to the building with his mask. Um, so as he is entering in the building, they are checking for his mask and um, he's going to come inside. Normally we would go to the cafeteria or gym space or some type of holding area as we wait, but Jackson will not have that opportunity. He will um, grab his grab and go breakfast that will be provided in a, a few locations um, throughout the building and he will report straight to his first period class during that time. Uh, at his first period class, his teacher is there to greet him with her own, uh, his own PPE and protective materials. And each teacher will also have their own temperature where Jackson will then go through the same screening process that was mentioned earlier with our staff uh, he will have uh, scanned in his QR code reader and responded to the questions or responded to the questions as he enters the classroom where he will um, have his temperature checked at that time by his first period or homeroom teacher and enter into the classroom. All right. So hold on right there, Barry, Dr. Barry. So now let's go all the way back. So when Barry mentioned he would go into the class, he, he would enter the building, she said that there was a team that had identified the appropriate entrance. Every team, excuse me, every campus will have what we call a pandemic response team. What we recognize is that every building is set up differently. Uh, some of them are, are similar in structure, but how they drop off and pick up may be a little different. And so we felt like it was important for teachers on that campus to be able to make some decisions about how we will respond and how we will kind of manage, manage this pandemic and manage the situation during the pandemic. And so the pandemic response team will be made up of the principal, the assistant principal, a counselor, teacher or teachers, uh, a, a custodian, cafeteria worker, and possibly an elective teacher. It's important for all those teachers to be able to have conversations about what is the appropriate, uh, what's the best place to have a controlled entry into the building. We will make sure that, the, that, that we will reduce the number of entrances into the building. And so we'll have a controlled entry for students. And then we'll also have a controlled entry for staff. Because what we know is that we have to make sure at a minimum that people that come in the building will have on a face mask. And I believe Ms. Van Camping can talk to you later about the importance of the face mask. But we want to make sure that no one gets into the building without a face mask. Again, that, uh, that, that pandemic response team will also help us 
to understand kind of what happens when a student has a positive or has a, has a temperature and we need to respond. But Dr. Barry, let's go ahead, let's continue to go forward with Jackson. Jackson has no temperature. Jackson is now in the classroom. He had the breakfast in the classroom. And so now Jackson's in the classroom waiting on first period to start. Uh, take us through what happens uh, throughout that period and then the change of classes. So in the, the classroom, is, as we have all stated throughout the night, um, this is uh, some decisions that have to still be made around uh, the, the classroom, depending on the space of the class, um, depending on the location of the class. As Dr. McFarland just mentioned, that pandemic response team will be, turn, be determining what the inside of the classroom looks like. Is there room to socially distance the, the uh, desk? Will there be plexiglass options available for that particular classroom and that particular space? Um, so those are things that are, will, will yet to be determined within the classroom. However, we know that the students will be there uh, with their mask on. Uh, the classes that they will be attending, again, um, is yet to be determined. Uh, uh, campuses are still working on master scheduling. Uh, I know there were some questions earlier about uh, will Jackson be going to band and, and fine arts? And uh, will Jackson come every day or will he go every other day? Um, so uh, those are the details of the master schedule uh, that is still being worked out. What classes will they attend uh, and when? What we do know is our, our hope is that Jackson will be able to be in uh, either a cohort where he is in a general area of the building or teaming, uh, however you want to word that, or he may be uh, in a specific hallway by a grade level in order to reduce the um, uh, amount of space where he would have to move during transitions. So Dr. Um, Dr. Barry, let me, let me just kind of speak to that. So because I know we have all secondary teachers on, we know that what's, what's uh, 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 practical for uh, middle school teachers and ninth grade teachers may not be as practical for high school teachers. What we do know is that at, at, at both of our, our, our ninth grade centers as well as our middle schools, we know that there's going to be some effort made to do, to do academic teaming or teaming to where classes are centrally located or at least located uh, close to one another so that students are not having to transition all across the building every period. Now, how those transitions will work, uh, that will be something that that pandemic response team, along with the, uh, uh, the pandemic response team and, and the principal will make kind of a decision on what's the best way to have kids transitioning within the building. Uh, what, we're, what we're doing though is we're uh, looking, we meaning the, the folks at central office, we're basically wanting to make sure that we have controlled, uh, controlled exits from classrooms and entries in the hallways as much as possible. Now, Dr. Barry, I do believe there was uh, there, there, that there's some consideration about the hallway and traffic and direction in the hallway. But talk to me a little bit more about that. In, and we're really speaking for middle school, ninth grade centers right now. We'll talk to high schools here in a second. Especially our, our, our middle schools and ninth grades, we know just the, the way that those buildings are set up, um, one directional hallways. Um, and not one-way hallways, but directional where we're walking on the right side of the hallway, which is many of the things we do now, or, or uh, walking on the correct side of the hallway to help with the flow of traffic. Um, also using the bells to help navigate that and um, give us some flexibility in the amount of kids in the hallway at the same time. So your cohort or your team may transition on a bell, knowing that uh, I think the question was in there earlier about um, adjusting class period times. And so definitely those are things that we would have to consider if cohorts are moving at different times, it may add a minute or two uh, to that transition. So we only have a small group in the hallway at the same time. Um, our hallway, our, our stairwells, forgive me, uh, would be one-way stairwell. So on one side of the building, maybe you're upstairs to control the, the flow there where students aren't all packed up passing each other. And on another um, side of the building, uh, it may be your down stairwells, which is what many of the campuses currently do um, now as well. So again, that pandemic response team would really be sitting down to evaluate the spaces 
uh, for movement to occur more effect uh, efficiently. So as, as you can as you can tell, teachers, I know you 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 hear us uh, uh, sharing kind of thoughts and ideas, and and you realize there's a lot of logistical things that we have to tie up. Again, that was also one of the reasons why we felt like delaying the face to face. Uh, gives us time to work through all this process. And you'll, you'll definitely be a part of helping us to kind of finalize and firm up, up these procedures. And so uh, let, let's, let's stop for a second because I know we shared a lot. So I'd like to stop for a second, Kirshner, if we could, and just try to entertain some of the questions in the chat about the day in the life up to this point. We will leave this period here. We'll, we'll leave this classroom with Jackson here in a second. And then we'll go to, we'll go to specials and we'll go to lunch and then after school. But right now, we just want to stop and try to address some of these questions from the time Jackson got up that morning to the time he made it into his first period class uh, where we are right now. So uh, uh, could you just kind of lead us through any questions that you think we need to address, uh, Kirsten? Yes, uh, sir. We had uh, several questions about the, the beginning of the day, those buses, talking about the social distancing and will there need to be more bus routes, uh, a longer time, and and then also that if buses start arriving at campuses earlier, does staff need to be there earlier to, to greet those students to start the screenings? Gotcha. So I believe that uh, Mr. Reeves may be on uh, uh, to talk about buses. Uh, Mr. Reeves, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing to prepare our buses for safety and then uh, the question about our, our, the, uh, the density of the buses and how we're going to manage that and whether we need additional buses or not, uh, how we'll adjust, how we'll make that adjustment. Yes, sir. So um, concerning the number of routes, we're looking at um, keeping all routes to a 60 to 65 percent capacity. Um, we do know that there are some areas that we will need to add uh, some additional routes to maintain that percent on the capacity. Uh, but one thing I wanted to mention to um, how we sanitize these buses, we will do um, an AM uh, midday and PM sanitization. So in between an AM route, between AM and midday we'll sanitize, between midday and PM we'll sanitize, and then it'll, that evening it'll be sanitized to be ready for the next morning uh, on the AM. Um, Dr. McFarland, was there any, was there another question? Um, I, I believe, I believe you answered the question, it was, and I think it was the one about the, uh, the adding of bus routes uh, and, and we're, we're prepared to do that, especially on those, those buses that are, that are, are, are extremely uh, condensed. The other question I think, uh, Randy, I don't know if it was asked, but I, I do know uh, if we're thinking about the high school, we know that we also, also run quite a few buses back and forth between uh, uh, BRJ uh, uh, CTE Center. And so uh, I, we may not be prepared to address that question yet. And if not, that's okay, but if we are, uh, you know, I think I, the question I would have would be, so as kids are transitioning back and forth from BRJ, how are we addressing a sanitization on those buses? So uh, what the plan is for all of, basically we call them just our CT shuttle buses. Um, we will supply the, the driver um, with the cleaning utensils and supplies they need because they, a lot of the times they will just stay with that bus um, you know, parking in um, one of the high school parking lots or CTE waiting for the next um, shuttle to go. So we will supply them uh, with the materials they need to, while they're waiting for the next change um, in class periods to be able to sanitize their bus. All right. All right, other questions, Kirsten? Um, we've had a lot of questions about uh, just the sanitizing of the spaces, and I know uh, Mr. Reeves has some information about our ABM crews, but just like what that happened in the classrooms and after breakfast and, and just things like that. Mr. Reeves talked about on the buses, but can you talk a little bit about what's happening uh, in the classroom and inside the buildings? Mr. Reeves. Yes, sir. So um, one thing uh, I failed to mention that applies for both um, our transportation employees and our custodial employees is that they will be following the same screening process that all the district employees are. They will be um, coming in, having temperature check, answering, you know, going through the screening um, each morning or each time that they are um, to run a route. Um, so one thing that you may not know is that we use a uh, hospital grade disinfectant. 
And it's a disinfectant that we not only use to uh, physically wipe surfaces, but we also use our uh, electrostatic machines. We can put that liquid into that and um, e-mist and disinfect um, a room. Another thing that uh, the employees uh, for both Durham and ABM will do is they will wear the same PPE um, that we wear, masking gloves. Um, but what we're changing in the cleaning process is and putting a priority to is all the uh, high touch uh, areas, whether they're door handles, light switches, um, chairs, tables, uh, and also restrooms. They will be monitored throughout the day with designated personnel to, to maintain uh, the sanitization for those areas. All right, Mr. Murray. Thanks, Mr. Reeves. All right, Dr. McFarland, um, some questions about scheduling. And I know Dr. Berry, as she's continued through the day of the life, but like keeping students contained or block scheduling and what that could look like uh, so there's not as many transitions. So yeah, we, we're looking at, at any kind, we're looking at the modifications that we may need to make with scheduling. Again, the number of students that we have kind of would, would, would definitely help us to make that decision and that determination. Uh, we are, that's something that we will likely be able to come back uh, in, in the, by the, by the mid-August mid to kind of let, let everybody know kind of how that's going to look with, within a face-to-face -face format. Again, the good thing about this is we're, we're, we're ahead of the game and we'll be pressure testing our protocols all the way through the month of August. Uh, because what we know is the first day of face-to-face -face is actually October. So we'll, get, we'll have a chance to really walk through this process. We'll have our, ca our, our schedule actually set. I think there were some other questions also about the uh, schedule and actually the time that it'll take and, and whether we'll be adjusting our schedule. Because we know that if teachers are actually at the door taking temperature, uh, that may take some time. And so we, we will likely have to adjust our bell schedule. Uh, we have to figure out kind of what that what that what the sweet spot is for that schedule to be able to give us enough time to uh, check the temperature, get kids in for them to eat, and then also continue to continue to go on with the day. We also know we have the late bus, and so the the pandemic response team will be able to talk about and 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 come up with that procedure uh, when we have a late bus. Uh, but the main thing for us is as we're talking about uh, uh, managing students off the bus, we have to be clear that we have to screen kids when they get off the bus to make sure they have a mask on. And then we have to take their temperature uh, in their first period class to make sure there's, to make sure that if there is any kind of temp, any kind of temperature, then we can respond accordingly. Now with, with, with Jackson, we said Jackson didn't have a temperature. Let's now stop and go back, Dr. Berry. And so let's assume now that Jackson does have a temperature. So if Jackson does have a temperature, we want to talk to you about what happened. So I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm standing at the door, I, I scan Jackson's at a temperature and he has 102 the, uh, fever. And so we know that is a clear sign that something is going on. And so uh, uh, Dr. Berry, so what would happen, uh, you want to take him to that piece or I can take him forward? Um, go ahead. I was really, I was searching to see if uh, Ms. Van Campen is she, on here because from is. a teacher perspective, we're going to be sending them um, down to the, the nurse's office uh, as we normally would. The spaces will look different in terms of where the, those students will report to. And then the protocols are in place. I believe Ms. Van Campen has also uh, uh, kind of walked through with the nursing department. Okay. And so let's, let, so basically, and I'll come to you, Ms. Van Campen, here in a second. But what happens is, and Dr. Berry said nurse's office, but it will be a location. But uh, so when I, when I determine that Jackson has a temperature, then Jackson is actually relocated to a different space. And we have it, we've been talking about what we call this space. You know, I think in the, in the, in the uh, recommendations, they call it isolation room and other room, but we feel like that's a little, so anyway, we're not sure about that. But we're saying that there will be a space where we'll be ro relocating Jackson to. And then also, Ms. Van Campen, why don't you talk to us about what happens when we have a kid that we have identified there is a pot the symptoms there and there's a possibility that there's an issue. Uh, can you uh, talk to us about that, Ms. Van Kappen? Yes, sir. Um, I would, we would, you would call the nurse's office just like you would, you would send that student out and they would be met at the, um, by the nurse or the clinic aide and they would be assessed. It's, um, I saw a question here about 
um, would you, you know, with the heat and everything, the temperature could read high and would you be expected to let them cool off? And we wouldn't expect you to do that. We'd expect that if there is a um, abnormal temperature, when you take that temperature first thing in the morning, you would just send them to the relocation room that our whatever the room is going to be called. Right. And um, I've gotten used to the relocation room. So, right. uh, it's been one thing they'll do point out um, when they talked, I think that was one of the things about the temperature. It is a little bit different than just a, a 97.9 or 98 temperature. Yeah. Uh, to consider. Yes, it's over, um, it would be a temperature that's over 100. Right. Now, I will tell you that if you have a kid that's like 99.5, and you want to get them checked out, please send them to the nurse, to the clinic. The nurse will reevaluate them and recheck their temperature and then determine what steps we take from there. And, and as we mentioned, this is, uh, these are our initial thoughts. And as we get more and more, more information, we get more information daily uh, from the CDC and from Tarrant County about the virus. And so, uh, we will uh, be able to come back with some hard, fast uh, protocols later. But right now, uh, they, we, we've identified that there's a temperature. The student is, is uh, that temperature is confirmed. So the student is now in this isolation room, relocation room, whatever we want to call it. But the student is away from other kids. And in that room, we have, a, we have an adult, uh, preferably a, a medical professional. But if not, then we do have a professional in that room. And in that room, that person will have PPE on that looks very similar to what you would see in an ICU. Basically, a face shield, face mask, uh, scrubs, and the whole the whole uh, uh, gear will be be present there to protect that person. And the student will remain there until we can get a parent or someone to come and pick them up. Again, we know that we will have to work through that because we know sometimes parents won't come to pick the student up, and so we have to make some provisions for that as well. But again, our goal would be to get the student in a location where we can uh, get them uh, uh, removed from the campus and parents can possibly get them tested if that's what the health department tells us at that point. Dr. McFarland and Nurse Misty, there's questions about um, other COVID symptoms. That list of COVID symptoms seems to grow um, every week. And some of those symptoms are also what you would see with a common cold or flu. And so it, w w would those symptoms also um, justify sending the student to the relocation room? Yes, um, we want to err on the side of caution. So if a student's complaining of a sore throat, a headache, and maybe they have a cough, you definitely want to send that student to the nurse to be evaluated by them. Great. And also a lot of questions about uh, face coverings, PPE, what's provided for teachers, what's provided for students. Do uh, the face shields, are those acceptable? Uh, Y'all want to talk about that, Nurse Misty? So, so yeah, we'll talk about that, but I know uh, there was a question about the day in the life of a teacher. Yes. So we will, we will have a day in the life of a teacher. We'll have a day in the life of an elementary student, day in the life of a secondary student, a day in the life of a student receiving a special education services, because we know that there may be different there. Uh, but Missy, yeah, let's talk about the teacher, uh, Missy, and then talk about what, what the requirements would be for teachers uh, during that process. So what we do have, and, and what I just want to touch on that's really important, is that we do, you know, the, we do have the mask mandate. We have these masks available. So if students forget their mask, or if um, a teacher were to forget their mask, these are these, we have these masks available. We also have these masks that are available, which are the reusable masks. And we were able to get um, an allotment from TEA that provided us with these. We also have um, these, which go on like so, and these are your face shields. And so, um, and if you wanted extra protection, this is my mask from today, so hold on. You would just wear, you would wear, you could wear, and I would urge, especially, some of our special ed population, you could double up and wear both of these, okay? And this is what you would see if you walk into a hospital right now. Many people wear both the shield and the mask. I will tell you that there are 
Is it okay if I speak about the case studies right now, Dr. McFarland? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, for sure. Um, there are um, case studies out, um, and you can even, if you wanted to, you can bling your shields up a little bit. I just want to point that out. But um, there are case studies out there. Uh, actually, CDC has come up with two case studies, and Journal of America of uh, Medicine came out with another one, which talked about um, these hairdressers, and they were just wearing regular cloth masks, okay, and they were both infected with um, they were both infected with COVID nineteen, and during their most um, infectious time period, they were taking care of customers and their clients, not one of over 150 clients um, was, uh, became COVID positive, not one. So that just shows you the importance of the infected person wearing the mask. So I just wanted to stress that, um, I can't stress that enough, that it's really important that we all do our part and wear a mask. Now I know that some people aren't able to wear the mask for different reasons. And we do have the face shields and I have some that are a little bit longer. This one's kind of short. You'll see it kind of goes, and you'll see the coverage that it gives to you. There are proper ways to put on these things and we will go over all of that with you guys and you will all be trained in that. So uh, Misty, uh, definitely, definitely appreciate all the, the great information, firsthand information you've given us. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about what happens if Jackson's parent, Jackson mom, takes him to uh, takes him to the the uh, takes him to get tested, and he's confirmed that he actually has COVID nineteen. Now, what happens to everyone else? Uh, er everyone else that that around? And actually, before you do that, why don't you actually talk to us about what has occurred during our strength and conditioning this summer? and the protocol we've used this summer, and then we can kind of extrapolate from how we have responded this summer to positive cases with students to actually what we would do uh, in the fall. Absolutely, Dr. McFarland. Um, and we have had, we've had a couple of cases, a few cases actually this summer during our strength and condition training. And um, what has happened is that we, um, in one case, we were notified um, after the fact um, the student had been at practice the previous week and that week uh, and Monday of that week. And we were notified that evening that that particular student had found out that their family was exposed. So the entire family went and were tested. And one of them that our student, right, was COVID positive. And so what we did was we immediately notified, um, the coach notified the athletic coordinator who notified myself in the athletic director, um, we let director of communications, Mr. Kirshner know. Um, we immediately were in contact with the Tarrant County Health Department where we obtained a letter. So now we have a standardized letter for everyone. Um, we send that letter out via teacher. Um, we did via coach this way because they have that relationship with the parents and everything. Um, we talked to that student, found out who that student was in close contact with. Was this a student that was in basketball and volleyball or just volleyball or just basketball? And then we, we sent those letters out based on the information that we had to those coaches and to the players. And, um, and actually the only people that were needed to quarantine were that student's partner in the weight room and the coach. Um, because they had been in close contact um, without, without the proper PPE. So, um, you know, because when you're yelling and you're coaching and all of those things. And so one thing that we do know is that um, right now the definition of close contact is within six feet um, or less for 10 minutes or more. But we know, and that's masked or unmasked, but we know that that may actually change because of these case studies for the mask. So I just say that to let you know that as much as we try to make sure we have everything down for you guys, um, we want you to know that, that as things change, we'll let you um, 
we'll, you will be the first ones to know as soon as we can get that out there. All right. Any other questions at this point, Kirsten, or do we need to? Again, a couple about the notification, either when it's a student that gets it or a teacher because of HIPAA. Um, how would that work? Would they say, oh, it was, it was Johnny, or would it be that someone you were in close contact with? It would just say, you just get a notification. It doesn't even say, it would just say, let's say if it was um, cross country, boys cross country, the letter would just say to boys cross country. And then it would just say, you have been in close contact with someone that is um, COVID positive. Please monitor yourself for signs and symptoms. And it would give you all of those things that you need to watch for. And I will tell you, be, um, even for you as teachers, um, our HIPAA is a very real thing, and so is FERPA. And so we keep um, privacy laws are very important to us, and um, that's why all the screenings, the nurse on the campus will monitor those health screening forms and, so that um, they'll be the ones that have that contact because they're already the ones that are privy to all of that health information anyway. All right, and so let's let's take this scenario forward. Let's assume that Jackson actually uh, uh, contract actually came back positive for COVID nineteen, and then Jackson's teacher, uh, the the teacher began to show signs, and the teacher actually had had uh, realized uh, tested and they were positive and were required to quarantine. So Dr. Kohler, uh, so uh, the teacher now is required to quarantine for fourteen days. How would that impact the teachers' leave, the teachers' sick days? How would that impact teachers, uh, uh, the, te the teacher on the campus who's contracted COVID-19 and is required to quarantine? That's a great question. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. Um, there are I didn't, provisions. I didn't ask it, Dr. Cole. I just read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a great question. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Uh, there are provisions under the Federal Family First Coronavirus Response Act, and it provides um, full or partial paid leave if an employee needs to quarantine um, either because they are sick with COVID or they, um, they're caring for someone else who has COVID. Um, there is information on our district website on the staff um, page that um, you know provides information about this type of leave and what is covered, what isn't covered. Um, but I will say there are limitations on the amount of leave provided. So if that um, federal leave is exhausted, it may be necessary for a staff member to utilize their accrued state and local leave days. But there are some provisions and some protection um, for someone who is sick, who needs to be quarantined, or care for someone who's sick or needs to be quarantined. All right. So, uh, Ms. Ms. Van Campen, uh, let's assume that Jackson was actually in the class and uh, other and the teacher has it and the, and the entire class has now been exposed. What happens or how do we determine what to do with the entire class? We would actually, we would talk to Tarrant County Public Health Department and we would defer to them and they would give us guidance and we would follow their guidance on what to do next. Gotcha. And that, that's really an important part. We, we want you to know that we will, we will uh, as it relates to this, this virus, everything that we do, we will be uh, uh, contacting our, our Tarrant County Health Department. And so, uh, because things change and as things change, they'll be able to give us the latest information about the virus and really about the actions that we can take to mitigate the spread. So everything that we do will be uh, uh, it will be really advised through the advice of Tarrant County Health Department. All right, uh, Kirsten, any, any, any other, any other? Yeah, so, so questions about uh, air ventilation, the, the windows, the fans, our, our, our systems that we have in the buildings. Uh, I know Mr. Reeves is an expert on all our uh, AC systems, uh, but also just we know how important it is for that ventilation in the classrooms. And so, Ms. Reeves, what are, what are our systems like for bringing in that fresh air and getting that air circulated? Yes, sir. So, um, there are a few schools in the district that uh, have wi windows that you can open. Um, there's only several of those. But all of the systems um, within the school facilities, with, within all facilities, 
have the ability to not only run uh, the fan manually um, the whole time, you know, that we're in the building, but they also have the ability to bring in um, fresh air, which is required um, by the state. We have to bring in a certain uh, amount of fresh air. One thing we, we definitely have to monitor is the amount of humidity that comes into a building. But all the systems uh, have been checked. Uh, everything has been identified. If there's been any issue um, with circulation in an area, um, it's been corrected. Um, so we're in, we're in good shape as far as that goes. Great, thank you. Right. Kirsten, I do know I saw a question about, uh, and I know this question was asked last, uh, last night as well from elementary teachers, was concerning uh, dress code and the yes. ability to wear, uh, the ability to wear scrubs. You know, we're evaluating that. We recognize uh, that uh, we're in a unique situation and we recognize that, that scrubs may be a, a viable alternative, uh, especially uh, in, in classes where we know uh, there is gonna be some, there's gonna be connections and all that. So we, we're working through that. We'd love to hear your perspective on that, uh, teachers, that will help us to kind of make a decision. Uh, we, of course, want to always remain professional, but we also want to make sure that you are able to, uh, to protect yourself and able to, to, to have a, uh, uh, an opportunity to be safe and, and to uh, um, be able to be comfortable as you're, as you're doing, doing, doing the work. So we Ryan. are in it. Ryan. All right. So we, go, go ahead, Kirstner. Um, yes, it's just some questions from our, our coaches and our band directors, mm -hmm. the, uh, these uh, UIL and extracurricular activities, uh, how, how those will look when students are back in the building. All right, so let's assume that, let's, let's take Jackson now. Jackson's first period, uh, first period has ended. We have a controlled exit from the first period class, and let's assume that Jackson is in band, okay? So Jackson basically goes down the controlled hallway enters into the band, into the band, uh, into the band room. Of course, Jackson has his mask on. Uh, students are required to keep their mask on as they're transitioning uh, and as they're getting their instrument. Now, the thing that looks a little different about, about band and about choir and those, those activities where we know uh, there's a likelihood that students may have to remove their masks. I think UIL and, and also the uh, Fine Arts Association has given out some recommendations on how to do that, on either how to practice in by sections, and so maybe we take the trumpets, and maybe the trumpet section goes outside. Maybe another group goes into the cafeteria or some other place, the gym or other places. But the students are relocated to places where they can actually practice together. They but they maintain the distance. Uh, the distance may be a little greater because of the projection of their of their of their voice and projection uh, of the uh, of the possible uh, possible. Uh, um, liquid uh, as they're playing and so but there are clear gui guidelines uh, from UIL that uh, the uh, coaches and the uh, sponsors have been given and where we don't have those clear guidelines we'll be creating those. The area that, that is probably most concerning quite frankly from my perspective and Misty please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong but what I've seen quite a bit of is choirs. Choirs seem to be a very creates a very uh, um, you know, I guess a, a vulnerability, for lack of a better word, because we know that choirs are singing. We know kids are, are actually having to project. Uh, and so uh, how we practice with choir may look totally different. It may look different. It, 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 excuse me. Not it may look different. It will look different. Now, what that looks like, we'll be working with the, with the teachers and trying to figure out what's the safest way to continue to help kids develop their skills, but to do it in a way that they don't uh, uh, place everyone else in jeopardy. So those things will look differently. However, they will, we do anticipate moving forward with all of our electives as we have done in the past. We just know we have to do it in a safe way and figure out what that looks like. Uh, Misty, would you like to add anything else to, to, the, uh, to the fine arts or athletics? I know we've been with athletics, cheerleader, band, um, ROTC, those, all those activities have been ongoing right now with strength and conditioning. So uh, Misty, maybe you wanna share a little bit about how they're managing it now. Yeah, so with all of these activities that are going on, we are checking, uh, we're doing the screenings every day, and we've had, um, and we do the temperature checks daily, and that's really worked for us really well. I mean, the, the cases that we've had positive are just what we will see when school opens, actually. You know, they're, they're just community acquired. They haven't been passed. One thing I'd like to note, and I think is really important, 
is that we have not transmitted it between kid to coach, coach to kid, nothing like that. There's been no in-house transmission of the virus thus far. And I believe that's because we have good practices in place. For instance, in athletics in the barn, we, they sanitize in between. The students actually wipe down their own weight benches with the sanitized solution in between, um, in, you know, in between. And so, and then they hand sanitize every time and so I think these good hygiene practices and um, the good hygiene practices and, and sanitization and the cleanliness is really gonna be something that not only curbs this COVID for us, but flu and other illnesses as well. Absolutely. Dr. McFarland, we've had some questions uh, for Jackson and other students. Uh, what does lunch in the cafeteria look like during this time? All right, so now it's time Jackson's leaving band and now he's going to the uh, going to lunch. Well, the first thing is that the pandemic response team has really looked at all of the lunches. And one of the responsibilities of that pandemic response team is, a, is to determine, first of all, how many students can we safely fit in our current caf cafeteria. Now, what we mean by safely right now is how many students can we can we uh, sit in the cafeteria that are at least six feet apart because we know kids cannot eat with a mask on. So six feet apart. And what we have, what we'll have is like one way a cafeteria table. So nobody will be able to sit on the opposite side of that student. Nobody will be sitting facing the student. So sit, students will be sitting on the same side of the table. Now with round tables that may be a little different to do, but again, the pandemic response team will look at that cafeteria and then identify where kids can sit and where kids can't sit. Also, what we recognize is that uh, weather permitting, and we, it may not be permitted, well, it should be permitting in October. So if it was August, maybe not, but weather permitting, uh, we will be able to, uh, students will be able to eat outside. We'll also identify other spaces like the foyer of the theater or the foyer of the gym uh, or other places where students can go. We can create other spaces where students can go and eat. Maybe the library, but uh, we know that we have to do things differently because of where we are. Uh, we know that all, key, all students will not be able to sit in the cafeteria and eat in the cafeteria during the same time that they have been doing it in the past. And so we will have to get creative. Uh, we also have asked for campuses to identify outside eating spaces. And we are looking at possibly getting our students at BRJ to start building picnic tables. And so making sure that on every campus we have a series of picnic tables that are spread out outside in an outside kind of courtyard format to make sure kids have an opportunity to go outside, social distance, and still eat. But again, that decision, the decision of how many lunches and what the lunches will look like will be a campus decision. Uh, but again, the, the one decision that will be consistent across the board is that we'll have one-sided cafeteria tables, and that's really uh, elementary all the way up, for sure. So, Dr. McFarland, we've talked a lot about Jackson and really answered a lot of questions about what his day is. We've been able to touch on some things for teachers. We know we want to be able to, in the future, go through a day in the life of a teacher. But I know we have Ms. Ruby Batiste on to talk about students um, who get special education services who we serve in our district. Uh, Ms. Batiste, we have uh, just over 16,000 students enrolled in Crowley ISD, 1,700 of them. So just over 10% of our students are receiving some sort of special education services. Um, what does the return to school look like for them? And what does it look like uh, while we're at 100% online learning? Okay, hi, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Um, I saw a few of the questions in the chat regarding um, special education students and more so our students who uh, require a lot of uh, needs. Um, so basically, just like Mr. Keith and everyone else shared before, we just want to truly thank you for all that you've done during the spring. Um, everything that you've done has been totally appreciated from parents and even this summer, for those of you who uh, uh, participated in virtual summer school, um, it was a great win for the district and for the kids. And uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from the parents regarding that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just answer a couple of the questions in the chat before we talk about exactly what um, a day in the life of a child who is receiving special ed services may look like. Um, 
one of the questions that I saw was what curriculum will be available for life skills students? Um, Ms. Queenie Knox is our coordinator of special ed instructional services and we are currently working on what that will look like. We do know from what Mr. Keith said that we will be doing um, more teacher led instruction versus district led instruction, but our district team members will be available to help assist um, you all with planning those lessons. Um, Mr. Keith brought up earlier, and if you're not real familiar with it, um, we will have more synchronous learning while we are in this virtual learning environment. It's very, very important that while we are currently in this virtual learning environment, the students with IEPs and students who have dyslexia, um, that they get the best services possible. Uh, we'll be asking more central office staff members to be case managers and loop around with those parents so we can keep the lines of communication open. Um, so our lesson plans will be clear and easy for you to use and we'll have someone available to help you with that planning. But we want our kids to see you just like we can see you here in Zoom and we can kind of read some facial expressions that are going on. We want our kids to feel the same thing even if they're in a life, a life skills type setting. The same thing for our RISE students, our students who have autism who may be in a RISE classroom on the lower levels and who don't go out into the general education setting. Um, you know, again, we will want to ensure that you all develop engaging lessons and they see you as their teacher and not some worksheets taking place. I did see a question real quick uh, pop up about deaf education. Yes. One thing that we wanted to make sure for our interpreters and um, our, our teachers of students who have a hearing impairment, when we're in a virtual setting, that may be easier um, to get across. But when we come face to face, the, the PPE shield that Ms. Nurse v Misty Van Campen shared with you, that will be a part of your daily tools because it's very important for those students to see your mouth and um, your face to uh, communicate. Um, one thing that we know that is going to be difficult is, you know, let's be real, especially you secondary people out here. Um, we know, and I'm a secondary educator, most of my, my profession as well. Um, when we have students who refuse to put a mask on, you know, we don't want to make that a major disruption for the campus or your day. So that'll be it'll be very important for you to document that, you know, uh, I'm gonna use myself, Ruby. Ruby won't keep her mask on and let the parent know that. Not for it to be a referral to, to the principal's office, but let the parent know we keep that documentation and we may have to come back to our committee to talk about it because the parent may then have to make a decision that um, they may need to let their, their child attend the virtual academy school. Um, the other, the other part of that is, is like Nurse Van Campen said, is we as the educator, uh, we make sure that we have our mask on and those students who are willing to wear their mask, um, help them keep it on just to keep them safe for, from any possible contact that they may come in. Um, we've also discussed, Nurse Van Campen and I and Mr. Reeves have um, discussed in our, our classrooms who are behavior driven classrooms and our and the classroom for our students with autism, having sneeze guards and plexiglass in place in those classrooms to kind of mitigate the spread. Um, somebody said you are glowing. Can y'all see me? Yes, you look great. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I didn't know if I was having a lighting problem. So, um, <laughs> anywho, um, I'm off track, but we're working hard. We're going to get your input, especially those days that we come back in August 24th, because we can't do it without you. Um, you guys hit the ball out the park um, this spring, and, and you picked up everything. Um, as LPAC on campus, I see this, and I do want to address that, and the initial language pl uh, placement testing system, we are, um, let me address that real quick before I continue with special ed. 
Um, the testing center is new to the district this year and it is centrally located and Ms. Maria Anguiano and her team are, will be testing as far as arts go. Uh, we will still have arts and we're going to um, move forward with them still on a virtual platform and only under unique situations consider bringing the individuals into a group meeting. Um, I saw one other question in the chat and, and like I said, if I don't get to it now, I'll go through and I, I will respond to you and as well as the team, but um, we're, we're, your safety is first and that's what we're considering in all things. And it's not just gonna be a one-way dialogue. We need you all to speak up. If you come up with ideas, feel free to share them with me and Larry Williams, um, Ms. Quintella Knox. Uh, as far as special ed testing goes and referrals, we're still going to be testing kids. Um, we're gonna have a backlog, but um, we, we don't wanna refuse services. We, and when it comes to executing services, we don't want to tell the parents, well, we can't do that or that child can't come to my virtual class. That So if you feel sticky in that situation, pass it off to me, your principal, or to Mr. Larry Williams. All right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Baptiste. And you did mention the testing center, and I know we had a couple questions about English uh, language learners. So Ms. 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 Agliana, I know, I believe you're on the phone, I mean, excuse me, on the line. Ms. Agliana, can you talk about kind of some uh, specifics of what will happen in the testing center or how we deal with LPACs, how we deal with, with students that need the additional support uh, in this environment? Good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. McFarland. Uh, uh, with our language uh, testing center, we are very excited about that and just really excited that we're able to take um, quite a bit of that off of the campuses because these tests are quite intense and, and they do take quite a bit of time. And, uh, but with that said, we are having to hold off on that just a little bit until we're able to bring uh, students in face to face. Now the state has given us the, uh, the, uh, right and the approval to go ahead and place students in programs even uh, without the testing happening so we will do that we have a a little over 200 new students that are possible english learners that uh, my department will start contacting next week to discuss what crowley isd offers in language support and the recommendation for placing these students in these programs. We're also working very closely with Ms. Kunchik's department as far as how we communicate that to campuses. Now, uh, two years ago, we began placing our LPACs in DMAC, which I am so uh, excited and, and glad we did because this, we will continue to use that electronic platform in, uh, in our LPACs in DMAC um, as far as how we can gather those uh, signatures and we will be able to conduct those uh, LPACs through uh, DMAC. We also, for the support of our English language learners, several years ago started a LEP case management system. And what this does, it really uh, highlights the linguistics and the academic needs of our English learners. But we will be working on how that looks like on a virtual platform. We will be, uh, we do have uh, several ESL um, paraprofessionals and bilingual uh, paraprofessionals, as Dr. McFarland had shared and Dr. Kohler, their uh, roles might look a little different. And this is where we, where we could also use their support as uh, case managers for our students. We do have, and this is especially for our students that are just uh, at a much higher risk when we speak about English learners. Those are our immigrant, recent immigrant students, our newcomer students, and uh, newcomers in ESOL 1 and ESOL 2 as well. And uh, now that I do have your attention, I did see some low teachers. So I do want to let you know that I am working closely with Mr. Keith in curriculum and instruction. And uh, we are working on what this would look like uh, for our low uh, students, our low teachers, as far as virtually. And one of the programs that we're looking at is Ingenuity. So I'm uh, excited about being able to share that, some of that information with you very soon. Also, Ms. Aguiano, can you let us know where the testing center is located? Uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> it is over there uh, by the, um, 
Bus Barn. Yes. We need, we, need, we need the address. We, no, we need the address, Miss Agriana, the number, and the, all, all of it. <laughs> I think it's 2205 North Cleburne Crowley Road. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, portable number nine. Portable number nine. Is that behind the bus born, uh, the, the old bus, well, the new bus born, I believe, and so it's on I'm that track up. there. Yes. Yes, sir. Somewhere in the middle. Yes, sir. So Dr. Paul, we have that new center for parents to come to, but what about when parents come or visitors come to our other campuses during the school day? Okay, all right. So let's say Jackson, Jackson forgot his trumpet since he's in the band. Jackson left his trumpet at home. At home. And so now Jackson, uh, Jackson's parent shows up. She wants to take Jackson's trumpet to him and give him some lunch money. Well, when Jackson's mom gets to the front door, she enters into the, the safety vestibule. And we have a person uh, located there at the safety view because we are controlling all entrances and exits from our building. And so as soon as the parent gets there, there's a series of, que well, yeah, there's a series of questions that the parent will have to answer. And then we check the parent's temperature. At that point, we find out what the parent's uh, uh, need is at that campus. And uh, the parent is, we either take the equipment and, and deliver it, or if the parent needs to see the teacher or, or a parent needs to go into the building, then the parent will actually have to take a number. Uh, let's say the parent wants to talk to the principal. Uh, so the parent will, will take a number, like, much like you would do at a, at a restaurant or, or if you're going out to eat or somewhere now, you have to take a number and then you wait. And so this, the parent will take a number and will return to their car. And when the front office is ready for them, there'll be a text sent to that parent. And then the parent will be called in and escorted to where they're going. We will be controlling, uh, controlling entrances to all buildings. We'll be removing all seats uh, out of the uh, front office so that there will be no gathering there in the front office. In the front office, we'll have plexiglass that will be protecting all the, uh, the people that are the registrar and the attendance clerk and all in the front office. We'll have plexiglass there. Also, in the, in the uh, principal's office, the assistant principal's office, the counselor's office, diagnostician, nurse's office, anywhere we have an office where they may, may be, be, be required to engage with parents, then we'll have plexiglass that's protecting them at that point. Also, we'll have space in all buildings where we will have an opportunity for parents to come in and meet, but those rooms, those conference rooms will be set up with plexiglass so that if parents have to come in and meet with, uh, with our employees, then both the parent will be protected as well as, as the employee. No one will be able to enter the building without a mask on. So if there's no mask, we, we will likely have masks for them, but they will not be able to enter the building without a mask on and without having a temperature check. Now, we're going to be encouraging folks to make sure if they need to meet or talk to someone, we will be encouraging them to do it via Zoom, do it via a phone call. Uh, we'll be discouraging face-to-face -face meetings unless it's absolutely necessary, and we absolutely have to have it. Again, uh, that's something that we will, as we go, monitor that. But the main point is on every building, and this is something that is so important that we do consistently across the board. Uh, at every campus, the process of entering the building, uh, we'll, be, we'll be screening parents, uh, screening volunteers, uh, and also making sure that there'll be no just free entry into the building, sitting in the front office waiting. None of that will occur. Uh, we know that that'll be a little bit of inconvenience for parents, but we believe right now, if you go to Home Depot, you're inconvenienced. If you go to Walmart, you're inconvenienced. We believe everybody understands kind of where we are. And so we're going to be doing the same as we uh, restrict entrance into our building. Now, there was a question about volunteers. We know that we have some volunteers that actually work with us and help, help kids in, in particular ways. Uh, the volunteers, we're, not, we're still saying that they can still come and work in the building as long as they follow the same screening process that all of our adults are from our cafeteria workers, custodians, teachers, aides, uh, principals, assistant principals, everyone will have to go through the same uh, screening process in order to enter into the building. And so that's what we will, uh, we will be uh, uh, doing as it relates to that. Great. A lot of really great questions. Um, and just walking through this day in life gives us an idea of what that could look like for students. And like we said, we want to be able to do this for um, students and other programs. We want to be able to do it for the teachers. And so putting together information, materials, what that looks like in future town hall meetings. Uh, but Dr. McFarland, these questions we're receiving tonight from uh, the teachers are helping us a lot as no we work on those plans. 
No doubt. You know, one of the questions, Kirsten, that I'd like to address that is dealing with students' ability to participate in elective courses, uh, excuse me, uh, in, in, I said elective courses, but students' ability to participate in like band, athletics, choir, that are online students. Mm -hmm. Any student that is an online student will have all the same amount of access as any student that face-to-face. -face. We're required, because we are getting funding for all students, then we're actually required to provide the same services, whether the students are in a virtual format or whether they're in a face-to-face -face format. Now, the services may, in, in, in the mode of how we deliver it may be a little different, but we are still required to provide all of the same uh, services and the same opportunities. So uh, students that are online will be able to participate in band and will be able to participate in, in, in choir and, and athletics. Uh, again, how that looks, what that looks like in implementation, we'll work through that, but students will be allowed still to participate in those, in those, er in those uh, programs. Great. Um, I love this comment from Ms. Uh, Janetta Eaglin. Um, this is only a setback for a great comeback here in Crowley ISD. And so I just, uh, I, uh, I want to thank the teachers for, for your input tonight because it, it is helping us uh, provide better plans and be better prepared, um, not only for online learning, but when our students have finally returned to the buildings. We look forward to that day with great expectations. Dr. McFarland, what else do you want to make sure we touch on while we still have everyone here tonight? Well, I mean, I just want to basically extend my appreciation. Uh, teachers, we, we don't have it all figured out. We've been working really hard since March, but the reality is if you have ideas or input that you think will help us, we'll look, we're, we're definitely, definitely open to that. I do know that I've seen a couple of other board members uh, 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 come online. I know I saw Mr. Gracia and, uh, and, and several others. So if you're online, board members, and you like to have a word, I just want to publicly thank the board members. You, you really don't, uh, well, may, many of you know how hard they work and how much they care, but it's in times of crisis when you have to make a decision and they clearly say, we want to make sure that our employees are protected first and foremost, regardless of what any other district is doing, regardless of what the state is saying, our priority is making sure that our, that our, 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 our adults are protected and our kids are, are protected. That message was clear from, from all board members. And again, uh, Ms. Davis, Mr. Grassi, I see you, Mr. Grassi. If you'd like to say something to the group, Mr. Grassi, please feel free to do that at this time. All right, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Davis, any, any words? She, she's shaking right. her head. No, but thank <laughs> you. All right, no doubt. Ms. Ms. Uh, Hall, would you like to close us out for today? No, oh, that I will. No, I just want to say um, thank you so much. Thank you for all the great questions. And again, to echo uh, Dr. McFarland's sentiments and everyone else that's spoken tonight. Um, we, you know, we all have been teachers, right? Once a teacher, always a teacher. We're definitely in your corner. And we are definitely working to ensure um, that we cover every base and that we ensure that you have a safe, um, environment to return to and we appreciate the questions because you help push us um, to continue to strive for um, our very best so thank you y'all have a wonderful night Dr. McFarland. All right so thank you again again please share your feedback uh, we hope to come out with dates on our next uh, town hall and at the next town hall we will have pretty uh, defined plans August 4th I believe and August 6th we'll be presenting to the board of really what virtual learning will look like and our protocols. And so at that point, by, by August 4th and August 6th, we'll be pretty far, far down the line. So if you have feedback, please provide it between now and then. Again, we appreciate you. We have a lot of work to do, but I believe we can get through this together. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Kirsten, for pulling this together. And thank you, team, for being responsive. And I uh, definitely appreciate, appreciate the team, appreciate the work. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.